John Duffy, the secretary for this commission, and Father Assisi Saldana, the uh, professor who is going to give the lectures on the introduction to the Bible today, and all the participants of this uh, St. Paul Online, St. Paul's Online Bible College. I welcome you all very, very happily. It is a very, very new venture we are now started to spread the word of God, not only to India, but also to all the English speaking countries who are all interested to know about the word of God and also not only to know about the word of God, but also inspired by the word of God for our life. In a time of severe trial of at this time all over the world, it is very much consoling that we are engaged in reading, knowing, the revelation of the law of God so that it will give us strength to go ahead in our life of witness in our own life. This is a not only a new venture, but it is also a trial that you know the lessons, the whole Bible is divided into four uh, 20, 20, 40 lessons and Old Testament and New Testament and uh, yes, uh, 12, 12, 24 and so you will be given each month a lesson on a particular topic which will be sent to you by online by the secretary or the John Baptist. So you will know what is going to happen and what you now, when you hear the professor talking on this subject, you can also take notes and you will be already given notes by online. You can follow that one also later. So this is also uh, interpersonal. We are on our part trying to import the knowledge about the intensity or usefulness of the word of God, revelation of the word of God. But on your part, I appreciate your interest. You are taken to join this meeting and to study this uh, uh, Bible and also to be, to implement in our life. So with this, then I welcome you all again, and also I welcome Father Assisi Saldana, who is a renowned Bible professor, a rentist from Bangalore. Um, he is uh, very much closely associated with the CCBI Commission for Bible, and also our Indian Biblical Scholarship activities. So I am very happy that he is uh, dealing with this uh, topic on the first uh, lesson of our online Bible college. So uh, on, whenever we are, if you are able to see and hear, is able to okay, but. Suppose you are not able to have the video, you are able to also hear the audio with the audio, then it is also you can follow the thing. And also, if we at this stage, we are arranged around for 100 people only, this Zoom meeting, it may, will, it will be increasing, we will be increasing the uh, capacity so that Many more people also very easily can participate. So this is our uh, venture. So we'll see for the next time how it is. You can also give at the end your feedback, feedback 
we so with this i welcome father assisi saldana to begin his uh, classes lectures welcome father thank you bishop for the kind Father. words uh, thank you father john baptist for inviting me and a good evening my dear brothers and sisters i don't know how many of you know me but i'm very very happy to be here with you this evening well the program is discovering the bible introduction there is very much of the bible that you already know let's not think that you are completely ignorant you cannot be the fact is that uh, when you open the bible and read it thanks to the holy spirit that much of what you read is what you understand and what you understand in most cases is what you read but then you know there are parts of the bible which could be better understood if only you had uh, had more background knowledge of the bible and that is where classes like these are helpful first and foremost the word bible itself where does it come from it's a transliteration of the greek word biblos biblos meaning book bible is quite simply the book however a step back and the same greek word biblos can also mean scroll or a parchment you know earlier there were no books or codexes codexes a book that has got a spine and then you have pages on it the cauda on which the pages are mounted that's the book before the book came there was a scroll jesus took the scroll unscroll it and scroll it on the other side till you find the place the scroll is always always very very common it is thought that the word biblos itself as a uh, the word has come from the ancient seaport city biblos in present day lebanon in ancient times the word Le uh, the city of uh, the country of lebanon was called the land of phoenicia the phoenician territory biblos biblos was a phoenician port known for its export and trade of papyrus so it imported papyrus from egypt now because of this association the greeks likely uh, took the name of this city and adapted it to create their word for book we have many familiar words such as bibliography bibliophile library bibliophobia that is fear of books based on the same same greek word root now let's come to the catholic bible i'm sure all of you know that the catholic bible has 73 books 46 in the old testament and 27 in the new testament we shall mention more of this a little later when we get to the canonicity of the bible now the old testament contains three distinct parts there is the torah prophets nabim and the writings ketubim i'm sure you know an oh, new you know a hindi word from this word ketubim kitab means book book so the first part of torah to na from the nabim and ketubim ka the three words put together gives the word tanak which for the jews mean the entire old testament comprising of the three parts 
Now, by the time 180 BCE, before the common era, that's before Jesus, before Christ, now we call it before the common era, that is the date of the book of Ecclesiasticus, which means the book of Sirach. The, he mentions Sirach chapter 49, verse 10, he mentions the, about the 12 minor prophets. What does that mean? That means by the time of 180 BCE, the Torah and the prophets, including the 12 minor prophets, were known. All the writings, that means the wisdom writings, may not have been known. Because some of them, some Psalms, have come close to the first century even. So, now, we have to distinguish between what is called the oral tradition and the written tradition. The Old Testament is much dependent on the oral tradition till it came to being written. And you know when the oral tradition began? From about the time of the beginning of the monarchy. That's the 10th century BC. Time of Saul and David. That tradition at that time, which emerged around 10th century BC, we earlier called it the J tradition or the Yahweh tradition, because every time they mention God, they mention the word Yahweh in relation to God. That was born in the southern part of Israel, the, what is called a Judah. About a century later, the ninth century, you have in the north another tradition emerging called the E tradition, Eloist tradition. Why Eloist? Because every time they mention God, they call him Elohim. Of course, there are other differences between the J and the E tradition. But both these traditions spoke of one clear idea. Besides many other things they said, they dealt with a very important theme. That is, who are we and where we have come from? Who are we and where we have come from? Now, this aspect has been covered very much by two important scholars of the Old Testament, Mendenhall, Mendenhall and Gottwald, Norman Gottwald. It doesn't matter that you don't need to know these names, but before you come to this oral tradition, it is important to understand the constitution of Israel, the land of Palestine, the land of Palestine as it was known then. You know, the Exodus happened probably between 1250 and 1200 BC. And the, Israel, the, the, Jew, the, the Hebrews, as they were known, left Egypt, went through the desert of Sinai, went eastwards, then went uh, into the Transjordan, went northwards to the east of the Dead Sea, went up near Jericho, they entered into the Promised Land. Now, what has happened is, characteristic of these uh, Hebrews is that they were slaves in Egypt. So they know what it means to be downtrodden. Now, significant, significantly in Palestine as well, along the sea coast, they were very, very rich, who were the Hebrew slaves, have come to the Promised Land the land of Palestine. It was called the land of Palestine because the Philistines were there. And who are the Philistines? They have come from the Greek islands of Mycenae, diagonally across from Greece into Israel, which was that time known as the land of Canaan. Because the Philistines are a major occupying power, the land of Canaan is now called also the land of the Philistines or Palestine. And now these uh, uh, slaves from Egypt are entering into Palestine. They enter from Jericho. And when they get there,
they meet with the slaves who are working for the rich landlords along the coast of Palestine. Now, over a period of 1,200 to 1,000, during the 200-year period, these two groups of slaves, the Egypt group and the Canaan group, they coalesce. They become one. However, of the two groups, the Egypt group is stronger in the sense they have an identity. And what is the identity, identity they have? Their identity is that they know a God called Yahweh. And they bring this knowledge of Yahweh into Palestine. And over a 200-year period, from 1200 to 1000, they have a number of uh, liturgical feasts. The, fe the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And it is during the three important feasts that the people meet together in local shrines. And the story of the Egypt group gradually is absorbed by the people of the entire land of Palestine. Now, these two traditions, however, the J and the E are born shortly afterwards with the beginning of the monarchy. Now, why does the monarchy begin? Monarchy begins because the people of Canaan now, the people now, they are, uh, people of Palestine, they are saying the Philistines are so strong, and if we are so loosely connected, the 12 tribes, then we cannot fight the Philistines. Let us have a strong central government, give us a king, and who do they ask? You know who they ask? The king, whom do they ask? They ask Samuel. You know that, don't you? Yeah, they ask Samuel. And Samuel says, at first he's reluctant, gradually he gives them a king. Saul, Saul does not find favor with God, he's replaced by David. Now, it is from the time of David, followed by Solomon, one, David comes around the year 1000. Before that, for 200 years, 1200 to 1000, it is the time of the tribes, the 12 tribes. It is called the Tribal League. And during the Tribal League that you have the 12 judges, the type, uh, period of the judges. Now you have the beginning of the monarchy, Saul and David. It is with... David is from about 1000 to maybe uh, nine, uh, to 1961, 40 years of reign. And then you have an, an, 1000 to 960. So about 40 years reign. Then from 961 to uh, 920 to Solomon. And uh, around that time, the literary activity in Judah, in Jerusalem, came to the fore. And the oral tradition began, and the first written documents would be the J tradition in the south, and the E tradition in the north. As I told you, both traditions spoke about who are we and where we have come from. Unfortunately or unfortunately, scholars are a bit slow today to designate the texts of the Torah to either of these two traditions, J or E. Because they say we cannot be completely sure of their provenance, that means of their origin. So what do they call them? All these other traditions, they call them non-P. Non-P. I'll tell you what that means. Before we come to the non-P, we need to understand the D and the P traditions. If the J and the P told us who are we, our identity, and where we have come from, the D and the P tell us what 
we are called by God to do. What does God tell us? Well, the D tradition has begun certainly in the north around the 8th century. After the Assyrians destroy the north, the Israelites from the north come down to the south and the D gets mixed up with the traditions of the south. What happens is, it comes to the fore, especially around the time of Josiah and Prophet Jeremiah, who was seeped in what is called the Deuteronomistic tradition. The D tradition means everything in the book of Deuteronomy. Thou shall, thou shall, thou shall not. That aspect of sermonic kind of language, which you read in the book of Deuteronomy. And it is the Deuteronomic code that helps Josiah with the help of Jeremiah to reform Judah in the sixth century. And what about the P tradition? P tradition stands for the priestly tradition. That means the P tradition is the priestly tradition. It begins in Judah, but certainly continues after the exile, the Babylonian exile in 587, it continues in the land of exile in Babylon. The pre priestly tradition began in Judah before the Babylonian exile, but it was in the exile that it took hold of all the oral and written texts of scripture until now and gave them the shape that we have it today. It gave it the peace stamp. You want to know the peace stamp? The peace seal of the priestly tradition. You open the very first book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the world. It was, the whole, the whole thing was void, etc., etc. Then he first enumerates what happened on the first day. There was evening and there was morning the first day. Then the second day, evening and morning the second day. And then the sixth day, then God created male and female. That's the seventh day. Uh, that's the sixth day. And the seventh day, God rested. Right up from chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 4a is the P tradition. So the mark of the P tradition is there right from the beginning of the Bible. Well, the P tradition is very, very important. Without the P tradition, we would not have had the Bible as we have it today, especially the book of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Now, the first, the P tradition, how long did it work? It began before the exile, I said, from 587. The exile was ended in 538. And it continued in Babylon, much after that, up to the time of Ezra, which is 428 BC, 428 BC, when Ezra took the first draft of the Torah from Babylon to Jerusalem. Ezra, the scribe, remember Nehemiah and Ezra? Ezra took the first draft of the Torah from Babylon to Jerusalem around 428. So remember that date, the 5th century, the, uh, the latter part of the 5th century, a draft copy of the law in Hebrew was presented in Jerusalem. This became what you might call the Jerusalem copy of the Torah. Of course, the significance of the exile cannot be underestimated. We might think that the exile was a big punishment from the Lord. It certainly was. For the idolatry, as the prophet said, if the Lord is going to send you into exile, just as the north was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722, the south, Judah, is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 587, and they are taken into exile. Prophet Jeremiah, Prophet Ezekiel, both of them together say, well, 
have been a disobedient nation. Much as we may fault the people about it, what is crucial is that God takes them into exile into, the, into Babylon. But you know, they are going to Babylon is not useless. Why? Because it is in Babylon that Judaism actually receives its true identity. Because it is in Babylon that Judaism, that the Jews really become literary. That means the books are now written. If earlier you had just documents like the J and the E, the D traditions, we're not entirely sure about the J and the E, that's why they are called the non-P. But Whatever tradition there were, they are now written down by the P redactor, the priestly redactor with additions of his own. He first works on the Torah. So the bulk of, not only the Torah, the bulk of the Old Testament, Testament subsequent to the Torah is developed in Babylon. The bulk of the Old Testament is composed in the exile. And you know what? Even though the people from Egypt through the Exodus came to the Holy Land with the name of Yahweh on their lips. But the prophets subsequently said, all the major prophets from Elijah, Elisha, and then the major prophets like Isaiah, Micah, Amos, Hosea, all these 8th century prophets and the prophets afterward, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, all of them said, you profess God with your lips, but your hearts are far away from him. They were given into the great sin of idolatry, Baal worship. But it is in the exile, just as uh, it will happen to us, dear friends, when we go on a retreat, we began to introspect, where have I gone wrong? And the Babylon, the time of the exile was a good time for the people to introspect. Remember, those who were taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar were the intelligentsia, the nobility, the artisans, people who could think. The only people who were left behind, I've got nothing against them, the farmers, they were not taken, not because they were not good people, but you can get farmers in any land. But artisans, the craftsmen, the, uh, the blacksmiths, silversmiths, goldsmiths, carpenters, these were the people who were required, along with the intelligentsia. And it is this intelligentsia that produces the literary work, namely the Old Testament in the exile. And the one crucial thing is, it is in the exile that they have that tremendous introspection when they begin to realize who their God, Yahweh, is. The belief in one God I believe, and there are many scholars who think like me, that belief in one God was firmly established only in the exile and not when they came to the promised land in the year 1200. No. It took from 1200 to about 500, that is about 700 years, to really understand who their God was. So I don't think you and I should sometimes worry that we have not yet understood our God. Yes, we struggle to understand who God is. And the Holy Spirit gradually intervenes in our life and help us, helps us ponder and ponder and ponder until one moment we say, yes, this is our God. We have God in our Jesus. And uh, dear friends, I go back now to Ezra, Ezra has taken a copy of uh, the Bible, uh, the first draft of, uh, of the Torah to Jerusalem. The copy is in Hebrew. And you know, this copy of the Bible in Hebrew, the Torah, generates for us three distinct copies of the Old Testament, uh, of the Torah in Jerusalem itself. Uh, following from this Jerusalem copy which Ezra has taken there. The first one is in the third century BC, 
300 years before Christ. Ezra has taken this in the 5th century, about 150 years later. By that time, the Jews have moved because of the Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, exile. Bulk of them were taken to Babylon. Another small segment of the Jews moved from uh, Judah to Egypt. Judah to Egypt, that would be southwards. Babylon would be eastwards. Along with the southward movement, Jeremiah was forcibly taken against his wishes. And now, 150 years later, 150 to 200 years later, the Jews who are in, uh, in, in Egypt, the children's, uh, the father's children's children have forgotten how to speak Hebrew. At that time, around the third century onwards, under the influence of Alexander the Great, Greek become, becomes the lingua franca of the entire ancient East, including Egypt, including Palestine. So under the dominion of the Greek empire and the Greek language, the Jews can now speak Greek. They need the scriptures. They have not lost touch with the scriptures, but they want to understand the scriptures for their children in Greek. And therefore, they get the scripture, the Torah, and get it translated. And there is a wonderful legend called the legend of Aristeas, where 70 elders sit in independent hearts and translate the Torah, all of them in 70 days. And when all the 70 translations were compared, the translations were found to be exact. Now, of course, you may believe that if you, if you like, but I don't. But the point, a significant point is being made by saying that. What does that mean? While we don't have access to the real word of God in Hebrew, we have it in Greek, but God has assisted us in the translation to such a degree that we can rely on the Greek translation to tell us of who our God is. That's the point of the legend of Aristeas. So that translation from the Jerusalem copy of the Torah, which Ezra had brought in the fifth century, now is translated into Greek. That Greek translation from Hebrew into Greek is called the Septuagint. Septuagint, LXX. LXX, following the 70 people who did that. Now, the other two translations that happen in, uh, in uh, Palestine itself is the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritans by that time were separated from the Jews of the south ever since the Jews from the north left under Assyrian invasion in 722. There were some Jews who were left there in the north. And they had no connection with those in the south. And so they intermarried among themselves and they formed a group, what is called a Samaritan. And gradually there was a lot of antipathy between the north and the south. And uh, they did not have close connection, which we see even at the time of uh, Jesus. Jesus following, going from, coming from Galilee towards Jerusalem, passing through Samaritan territory. He stays with them when he meets with the Samaritan woman, remember. And um, the third thing where the Jerusalem copy of the Old Testament is used, the Greek copy, uh, I mean the Hebrew copy is used, is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The 11 caves of Qumran, where we find significant copies of scripture in Hebrew used by a group of Jews who were most conservative. You see, Judaism as a movement began after the um, exile. Why? Why Judaism? You remember Judaism when the Hebrews left Egypt, how many tribes were there? 12 tribes, isn't it? 12 tribes. 
But by the time of the exile, all the 10 tribes are decimated. In between the 10 on the north, Judah in the south, in between is the tribe of Benjamin. That also disappears. And those who are taken into exile are from the tribe of Judah. Only one tribe remains out of the 12. And it is from the word Judah that you, tribe of Judah, that you have the term Judaism emerging. And this Judaism that emerges from the exile right up to the time of Jesus, about 200 years, subsequent to the Maccabean revolt against uh, the Seleucids, uh, you have the Hasidim who are called the, uh, the pious ones who comprise of the pious Jews who gradually break down into three parties. Right of center are the Sadducees. Left of center are the Essenes. Sadducees easily compromise with the secular rulers because they know which side their bread is buttered. They have got no hesitation in accepting, even accepting the Greek language and even the Greek ideas, etc., etc. The Essenes are so disgusted with what some of the Jews are doing that they separate themselves from, from, from Jerusalem, from Judah, and they form an independent settlement along the coast of the Dead Sea at a place called Qumran. They are called the Essenes. They're right of center. They're ultra-conservative. The Sadducees are ultra-liberal. And in between, the moderate ones are called the Pharisees. Actually, we might be blaming the Pharisees quite a lot. But you know what? It is the Pharisees who bore the brunt of the situation, the wicked situation, especially during the Asmonian times, subsequent to the Seleucids, subsequent to the Maccabeans. Uh, during the time of Seleucids, we have the Maccabeans, uh, Judas Maccabeus. After the Maccabeans, you have the uh, Asmonians and the children of the Asmonians. Under them, the Pharisees have to endure a lot of pain. They are the moderates. And so what I'm trying to say is that it is the Pharisees who continue the legacy of Judaism. Now, what happens is the Dead Sea Scrolls about which I was speaking, they are the legacy of those people who left uh, Jerusalem and formed an independent existen in existence in Qumran, the Essenes. Now those, their manuscripts were discovered in 1947 by a great uh, uh, archaeologist and scripture scholar, Dominican Roland de Vu. They discovered about 11 caves. He, he discovered the first cave and subsequently the most important caves were cave number one, cave number four, and cave number 11. Important Old Testament documents were discovered. And um, it is through discovery of that, why were these documents important? Because now you had flowing from the Jerusalem copy that Ezra had brought of the Hebrew Torah, you have the Septuagint of Egypt, you have the Samaritan Pentateuch, and you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. These three could be compared now to another document which was in Babylon. Mind you, Ezra had brought the first draft to Jerusalem. After the death of Alexander the Great, the situation between Judah and Babylon was not so good. You couldn't travel so easily as you could during the time of the Persians. At the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, because of Cyrus the Great, he allowed movement between the two. But now, the situation became more difficult. And the Babylonian copy of the Torah and the subsequent books remained in Babylon. The Torah remained in Babylon. The Hebrew text in Babylon, therefore, without further contact with Jerusalem, had its own independent history cut off from Jerusalem and Judah. 
And you know what happened as a result? That copy of the Hebrew text in Babylon had a pristine existence. That means in Jerusalem, the Hebrew text could be manipulated. But here in the exile, they preserved the Hebrew text with great exactness. So much so that it was this text, the Babylonian text of the Old Testament, that the Jews of Germany at the time of uh, subsequent uh, to Jesus uh, in the year 90, the Jews of Germany took this uh, text of, Jam of uh, Babylon and made it their official text of the Torah. This became the official text of the Torah, not the Jerusalem uh, copy of the Torah, but the Babylonian copy of the Torah. And in the fifth century of our era, 500 years later, this Jerusalem copy of the Hebrew Bible, well, it was a consonantal text. Hebrew in the beginning did not have a, what is called a, a, a punctuation marks, vocalization, vowel sounds, text critical marks. These were supplied only in the fifth century C, common era, after, after Christ. And this text today is called the Masoretic text. And it is this text that today is the Old Testament. It is available today in print called the BHS, Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Stuttgart is a city in Germany where this Bible is printed. But it is an almost an ecumenical venture in a sense. There has always been a Catholic scholar on the panel uh, 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 on the on the, the uh, on uh, on the panel, uh, there will there's all, all, always a understanding with Catholics as well, just as there is in the New Testament about which we shall see. Now the thing is, how did the BHS get hold of the Old Testament Hebrew text? Lots of studies have been done, but we have ancient documents, none of the old, very, very old documents are in existence, not even, not even one. What we have are massive texts from 1008 and 980 C of our era, Aleppo Codex and 1008, the Leningrad Codex. These codices, which are about 1,000 years old now, considering we are in 220, 2020, this is 96980 and uh, 1008. These two texts, the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex, basically the Leningrad Codex forms the basis of the BHS, Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Tensia. I am I am happy that Father Sisi introduced uh, the formation of the Bible and the beginning and so how it is all the different traditions and how we all the translations came and so very good. It is very nice uh, that he uh, has given this uh, basic uh, introduction to this. In, you know, Bible um, is, a, you know, it is a, we have it as a one book, but it is not a one book. You are, you are a, are very well aware of it. It's a collection of uh, 73 books for us Catholics, 73 books. And it is uh, simply they say, we can read the Bible, Bible, Bible. It is, uh, it is true. People read the Bible for different reasons. We all read the Bible. We all heard about the Bible. We all listen to the Bible readings, it is all true. But for different reasons, even the non-Christians, everyone reads the Bible for information. So that is called, the first of all, you know what is informative reading, it is called. Now we are studying the Bible. That is another uh, way we approach the Bible. It is not informative for the knowledge, but also study it so that we come to know 
the nuances of the bible or the different uh, uh, message a message given by god by this uh, by the bible with the bible so we that is one another method studying the bible we also approach the bible for prayer most of us uh, we always approach the bible for prayer mostly the psalms see priests and religious we have the duty to pray the psalms every day and also most of us read the gospels this is normal for prayer prayer that is also another thing you know some non christians also for anti christians they are also approach the bible to find out how they can catch hold of the other people and so take it word by word even some um, protestants or some other brethren uh, they normally read the bible and understand it word by word by that fundamentalism begins you know what is a biblical the fundamentalism in the bible it is there so many things are there and but then we have to read the bible we have to approach the bible to understand the revelation of god for the people of israel and for me today because bible is a word of god it is not just one simple uh, historical book or book of information or book of uh, different uh the histories of uh, different people no it is also not a uh, book the book of accounts of the israelites and of jesus of about the early church no it is basically for me for you it is the word of god word of god was relevant for the people of israel when when it was first revealed to them then it is also word of god for me today and it will be tomorrow so it is as jesus says in chapter 6 um, 63 and so my word is the spirit that gives life that is the way we approach we study we read and for this it is we have to take away the idea of uh, uh, taking the bible or approaching the bible word by word that is why we take the effort of uh, studying the bible and we take the effort of uh, imparting the bible message bible is not a simple book it is a riddle because if you go through the bible very carefully even first chapter there is a it begins with the creation story then second step chapter again creation story so if you go to chapter 6 of uh, uh, genesis or 7 of genesis there are different uh, perplexities for example noah is told to take the birds and animals certain uh, on pair and another place there is on seven um pairs so what why do we have all type of uh, differences so we have to study that's what father is telling about the traditions anyway that when we talk about on so you will know bible is even in the word in the gospels it is not that easy because in the gospels uh, in one place jesus says i have come with a sword to give sword in matthew and another place peace i give you so why and so all those things are if you read very very carefully many many doubts will come in the even we need not say about the book of revelation which i will explain to you later so in this context i exhort you to attentively pay attention to the lessons given and also note all your doubts so that you can also ask the father 
uh, for clarification at the end, then you will be a little more clear when you read the lessons well. So with this uh, thing, I exhort you again, and also be you know, all those who are now attending, you can also encourage other people also to attend this one. That means uh, the, to attend the Bible course, online Bible course, uh, enrolling their names with the Secretariat, uh, CCBA Secretariat by Bible, enrolling your name. Any number of people can attend. May not be possible sometimes. All will attend the, um, the online video conference, but then they will all get uh, uh, explanations and other things. So you are, uh, those who are here, uh, you are encouraged, you can also en uh, um, encourage other people also join this uh, course. So that it is an opportunity at this time of uh, pandemic crisis that uh, uh, we, uh, we also spend our time in studying the Bible and knowing about uh, the word of God and so on. Uh, with this, then I appreciate Father uh, Assisi. He will continue his uh, lessons. And also, I appreciate all of you again for having taken part in this uh, session. Thank you. All the best. Then, at the end, our secretary will talk to you after the uh, lessons of Father Assisi uh, Saldana. God bless you all. Keep safe, keep health, and bless us from God's mercy. Thank okay. you. So far, we have spoken about the Old Testament, how we have got the written Old Testament. Now we come to the New Testament. We begin with Jesus, of course. Jesus spoke, Jesus acted, he spoke in parables. He showed the Father's love through his miracles and ultimately his passion, death, and resurrection. Subsequent to his passion, death, and resurrection, we have the Ascension and the Pentecost. And at the Pentecost, the church is born. And with the birth of the church, the words and deeds of Jesus are remembered. We must Remember that if Jesus died, say, roughly around the year 30, we're not specific about the date, from 30 to 70. Why 70? Because in the year 70, the first gospel, that is gospel of Mark, was written. During this 40-year period, from 30 to 70, the words of Jesus, the deeds of Jesus are remembered. They're recollected. They're spoken again and again in different communities. And they are uh, not just remembered, they're adapted to situations. There is a lot of oral tradition that is going on by word of mouth, because there would have been people who were with Jesus and they are communicating what they had heard. Please note that at the time of Jesus, there were no tape recorded versions. If there were tape recorded versions, we would have had exact uh, this uh, word of God. But now the thing is, an exact copy of what Jesus said, but what we have is a true account, not an exact account. How do you distinguish between exact and true? If you stand before me, I take a photograph of you, that is an exact, that is an exact copy. But if I'm an artist and if I draw you, then my subjective emotions, the way I see you, that comes into play as I draw you. That's a portrait. A portrait is a true account, is the way you come across to me as a person, one person to another person. An exact account is taken by a tape recorder, is taken by a camera, but a true account is taken by one who hears the way I understand. And that we believe is better than just an exact account. And what we have therefore in the 40 year period is a true account 
which is adapted again to situations first in the oral form and then it is written first in compilations compilation of parables compilation of miracle stories above all the compilation of the passion narrative the passion narrative it looks like was the first thing to be written you know why <clears throat> needed the passion narrative they needed the passion narrative for the liturgy for the celebration of the eucharist and gradually the evangelists who were part of their own church communities wrote the gospels mark was the first gospel to be written about 70 c and then matthew and luke about 80 to 85 and then you have john around 90 to 95 the gospel of john gospel of mark begins with the ministry of jesus 15 years later matthew and luke begin with the infancy narrative of jesus another 15 years 10 years later 10 to 15 years later john begins with the pre existence of jesus you see what is happening as time goes by as we are reflecting more and more on the paschal mystery and who jesus is we are getting more and more interested in his human antecedents that means we are not just satisfied with knowing who jesus is from the time of his uh, uh, of his ministry we also want to know a little bit more so they start with the infancy narrative then they start john starts with the pre existence and in the third and the fourth century you have the uh, trinitarian and the christological controversies which are decided in the council of ephesus and the council of chalcedon where they finally define jesus is the second person of the blessed trinity true god and true man two natures in the second person of the blessed trinity that's the final definition that is given by the church in the year 451 okay now before the gospels of course you have the pauline writings which predate the gospels the first uh, uh, pauline writing was first thessalonians about the year 49 now when we have the new testament and the old testament old and the new the bible one thing we need to ask is how was the text presented in the new testament it was presented as scripto continuo there were no markings chapters and verses came later in the year 1227 stephen langton archbishop of canterbury he was a catholic uh, archbishop he divided the bible for the first time into chapters for each book chapters for each book 1227 and the chapter divisions were for the first time printed in the wycliffe english bible of 1382 with the chapter divisions the verse divisions within the chapter came much much later about 200 a little over 200 years later nearly 300 years later in 1551 they were done by a french uh, scholar scripture scholar named robin estian stefanos in the year 1551 the verse divisions in its third edition of the greek bible when the printing press was uh, invented you know what was first printed in the printing press the gutenberg bible it was the latin bible it was the latin bible in 1454 the latin bible was printed that was the first thing to be printed and the first greek bible to be printed was 1516 1516 called the erasmus bible erasmus bible 1516 okay you may ask the question we have the bible with us now bible for what bible is a faith document Father John Baptist read the scripture text for you. I have the same scripture text again. Second Timothy chapter three verses sixteen to seventeen. All scripture is breathed out by God, 
and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word of God is the soul of theology. Reading of scripture among Catholics seriously started only from the second half of the 20th century. With the encyclical of Pope Pius XII, Divino of Lante Spiritu, meaning inspired by the Holy Spirit. Which was written on 30, which was published on the 30th of September 1943. The significance of the Word of God was then stressed at the Second Vatican Council in its decree, Dei Verbum, and it has been given great importance ever since by all the popes and the synods. The Word of God is useful for preaching and for our Christian formation. The word of God is the foundation of evangelization. Now, I would like to link the word of God with inspiration, with the phenomenon of inspiration. How the word of God, the Bible, is different from any other spiritual book. You know, there are many spiritual books you read. Are those books also inspired? Something that Mother Teresa writes for her sisters. Are our St. Alphonsus wrote for the Redemptress. Are these works also inspired as the Bible was is inspired? The definition of inspiration was given by Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus in 1893. He explains how inspiration affected the biblical writers. This is what he says. By supernatural power, God so moved and impelled the writers to write. He was so present to them that they rightly understood. Then they willed faithfully to write down and finally expressed in apt words and with infallible truth the things which he ordered, which God ordered, and only those things, nothing more. There is a difference between revelation and inspiration. Though we say the Bible is a revealed word of God, yes, because it has come from God, but it has been written under the inspiration of God by human beings. So what is the difference between revelation and inspiration? Revelation implies infusion and perception of new ideas, new knowledge. Inspiration does not in itself imply new knowledge. Does not imply new knowledge. Many saints had revelation, such as Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque. In writing down their revelations, they had no charismatic assistance from God. And therefore, their writings are not inspired scripture. You can't take their writings and read them during Mass. Of course, you can read parts of them uh, during a homily. The priest or one who gives the homily or a deacon can read parts of these writings, revealed writings, surely. But not in the place of the word of God. Inspired writing has God for the principal author. Remember that. God is the principal author. He directs the human writer to ordinary sources and strengthens his judgment. Scripture may teach some truth which comes under the domain of what is known as speculative judgment, or may, it may produce some fruit by inciting practical judgment. So there is speculative judgment which concerns truth, practical judgment which involves some action. For example, take the book of Jonah. There is one truth that God is a God of all the peoples, not just Jews alone. This is a speculative truth, that there is one God of all the peoples. The manner in which this truth is communicated is through a story that involves practical judgment. 
Therefore, we cannot impugn or overthrow the truth by saying, you know, the book of Jonah mentions whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and there are no whales in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. Or that not all the Ninevites were converted. No, you can't overthrow the speculative truth of the book because one or two aspects of the practical judgment are not true. Or again, the book of Judges, the author does not commit himself to the historical accuracy of Samson, Jephthah, Deborah. Of course, these, these are personalities, but everything said about them may not be historically accurate. But the truth these persons communicate, that is important. And what is the speculative truth that these persons communicate? That idolatry brings on retribution, enemy invasion. But God never deserts his people in spite of their sin. He raises great leaders to rescue them. Or again, in the book of Job, how to understand innocent suffering. Or in the book of Genesis, the whole question about the fall of the first man. Now, the total extent of inspiration concerns all the faculties of the sacred author. Both speculative and practical judgments are inspired. Inspiration extends to all the contributors of each book. For example, the book of the Gospel of John is supposed to have at least three redactors. Three redactors. One Gospel of John. Not just written by one man. Three redactors because we can see sections in them. Now, who is inspired? The first one, second one, or the last one? According to the theory of inspiration, all three would be inspired. All three are inspired. Translations, what about translations? From the Hebrew to English, or from the Greek to the English, or to Tamil, to Kannada, to Telugu, to Konkani, whichever language, Hindi, whichever language, Marathi. Well, translations are not inspired. Except the Septuagint. I mentioned the legend of Aristias to you. The truth of scriptures. There is no formal error involving speculative judgment. Scriptures tell us about faith and morals. When you speak about inherency, it is linked to the author's formal object in his composition. For example, the story of creation in Genesis. Inerency is qualified not merely by the formal object of his work, but also by his degree of affirmation. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.1, Paul says, Christ is coming soon, imminent coming. How certain was Paul when he said that. Only to that degree of certitude present in his mind at the time of making that statement, only that certitude is attributable to the statement itself. Now, the consequence of inerrancy is not historicity. That means historical certitude. But what is the consequence of inerrancy? Truth. Truth is the consequence of inherency. Well, now we come to the canonicity of the Bible. We have what is called proto-canonicals, deuterocanonicals, and apocryphal books. Now, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, 39 books which were originally written in Hebrew are considered canonical by the Jews, by the Protestants and the Catholics. 39 books, all three except, whose inspiration was never in doubt. 
That's the meaning of proto-canonical. These are in Hebrew. Another seven books which were written because of the diaspora, the Hebrews being in Egypt, written in Greek, therefore, the Protestants call them apocrypha, hidden. Catholics call them deuterocanonical because their canonicity was in doubt for some time, but we have accepted them now along with the canonical books. These books are Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Sirach, Wisdom, 1 and 2 Maccabees, seven books, and of course the Greek additions to the books of Esther and Daniel. Because their inspiration was in doubt, you know, Saint Jerome doubted the inspiration of the book of Tobit, which he said to have translated from Greek to Latin in a night, within a night. So a total of 46 books by Catholics, 39 plus 7. New Testament, we have 27 books, Protestants and Catholics, total of 73 books of the Bible. The Council of Trent fixed the canon as 73 books. Now, the Catholic Apocrypha of the Old Testament are the 12 Testament, uh, the Testament of 12 Patriarchs, 3rd Esdras, 3rd and 4th Maccabees, Book of Enoch, Assumption of Moses. Their date is about 3rd to the 4th, 1st century BC. New Testament Apocrypha, we have the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Judas, etc., etc., from the 1st to the 3rd century CE. What is the difference between the canonical books and the apocryphal books, as far as we are concerned, Catholics? We find that in the canonical books, the account is brief, sober, objective, without fantasy. Now we come to the text of the Bible. Text of the Bible. Now what do we have in hand? As far as the Old Testament is concerned, all the original documents, nothing of it survives. What we have is copies of copies of copies. Finally, we have, as I told you a little earlier, the Leningrad Codex, which belongs to the 10th century, and the Aleppo Codex, close to the 10th century C. Based on these two codices, we have the BHS, Biblia Hebraica Chudgartensia. Besides that, what else of the Old Testament we still have, which goes very back, which goes early to the Old Testament period to the third century BC. We have, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them. We have got the Samaritan Pentateuch, which may be about uh, the um, third or second century BC. With regard to the New Testament, we have got three types of documents available. We have got the papyri, which are counted as P1 to P. 127. The 127 papyri we have distributed uh, in different museums and different libraries of the world, especially in Europe and in the US. Papyri, it doesn't mean papyri one is only one sheet of paper. Sometimes, for example, papyri P46, P47, P48, P46, P47, there can be a number, number of sheets, number of sheets. So there are significant papyri because they are the earliest from the second to the third century uh, uh, documents. They, are, they were written between the second and the third century of our era. They concern the New Testament, by the way. Then you have the uncial manuscripts, which are mostly written on parchment, leather skin. They are from 0, 01 to 0, 02 parchments. Each uh, uncial, maybe more than one parchment, some uh, uncial parchment, maybe the entire Bible, entire Bible, for example, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, they are almost the entire Bible. And um, from, they are from the fourth century onwards. Then uh, uncials means written in capital letters, capital Greek capitals. Then you have the minuscules, which is called. K 
cursive handwriting. They are numbered from 1 to 2882. From, they are from the 9th century onward. They're from the 9th century onwards. All these numbers, documents that I'm giving you is from the year 2012. I don't know whether more manuscripts have been found subsequent to that. Now, translations of the Old Testament, you have first the Septuagint, I've already mentioned to you, the LXX. You have the Aramaic version from Hebrew into Aramaic because, you know, gradually uh, Hebrew was uh, dumped and people spoke the dialect, Syriac dialect called the Aramaic. That was the local lingua franca of the people of the villages. And the Aramaic version is called the Targum. Targum meaning translation. When it comes to the New Testament, you have Latin, Old Latin and the Vulgate. And the one who uh, did the translation into Latin from the uh, Hebrew into Latin or from Greek into Latin was Saint Jerome. Then you have Old Syriac, you have Peshitta, which was done according to tradition by Rabula, Bishop of Edessa. Then you have many other Armenian, Gothic, Georgian, many, many other translations. Now let's come to the English translations. Now the English translation, actually you have, we have the literal translations the literal translations, mean, which means there's a formal equivalence. What is formal equivalence? When every word of Hebrew matches an English word. Every word of Greek of the New Testament matches the English word. It's a word for word translations. Word for word, a literal translation, the principle of formal equivalence, which seeks as nearly as possible to preserve the structure of the original language, whether Hebrew or Greek. We have these uh, literal translation Bibles, the following, the King James Version, the authorized uh, ASV, new, uh, the, N, uh, the new King James Version, the RSV, NASV, New Revised Standard Version, the ESV, NAB, NABRE, RNJB. These four, these translations are called the literal or the formal translations. And the one that has been uh, proposed for India this year from which, on the basis of which we have what you call the new lectionary, the three volumes of lectionary that was just uh, released on Palm Sunday is this, the ESV Catholic edition. Yes, with English standard version, it is on the basis of this version that we have the Catholic three volume lectionary base. So in future, this is the text that, that you will be hearing in the liturgy on Sundays, weekdays and feast days, the three volumes. And this is the text that seminarians will use in their studies so that they will hear this text in the classes and they will follow up that same text in the liturgy as well. So that, as far as scripture studies are concerned, you require, as far as scripture studies are concerned, you require literal translations because we have to get to the root of what the text means. Now, apart from these literal translations, you have the next type of Bibles called the dynamic translations. I'll tell you what the dynamic translations are. Dynamic equivalence in contrast to the Bible described above. Some Bible versions which have a thought for thought rather than word for word translation philosophy. That means I read an entire paragraph in uh, Hebrew or Greek and I translate that paragraph into English. Mind you, it's not a pressy. It's a not a pressy. It is better than a pressy. The advantage with a dynamic translation is more inclined to reflect the interpretative views of the translator and influences of contemporary culture. The approach involved in thought for thought translation is less inclined to preserve the structure of the original language. Instead, it proceeds 
by extracting the meaning of a text from its phone and then translating that meaning so that it makes the same impact on modern readers. Now, which are these uh, dynamic equivalent Bibles? The JB, Jerusalem Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, New English Bible, Revised English Bible, Good News Bible, Today's English Version, and the NLT, New Living Translation. So of these Bibles, which are dynamically equivalent, the CCBI of India has uh, given the imprimatur for the NLT, just as it gave the imprimatur for this literal translation, word for word translation, the ESV, it gave the imprimatur also for the NLT for thought for thought translation. That is called the NLT Bible. This is called the ESV Bible. This is followed by scholars and by students, and it is followed in the liturgy because we need to be completely faithful to the original text. And that's why you have the literal translation word for word. Whereas the NLT and Bibles like that, which are thought for thought, they can be used for your spiritual reading. That Bible came out in 2015. There was a 12 member uh, Indian scholars. I was one of them. We were involved in producing the NLT. This ESV came out in 2017, received the imprimatur, because we had the, uh, we worked on the NLT, we had a lot of uh, experience with the NLT, so we could move quickly with the ESV. And after the dynamic thought, literal translation, dynamic translation, you next have what is known as optimal equivalence. What is optimal equivalence? The terminology is meaningful, but Bible translations cannot be neatly sorted out into, into it says literal or dynamic. It says because sometimes it cannot be literal and it cannot always be dynamic either. You have to be somewhere in between, in between. And now which are the Bibles which are in between literal and dynamic, they are the CSV, that is Christian Standard Bible, and the NIV, New International Version. CSV came out in 2017, International, a New International Version, which is quite a popular Bible actually, came out in 1978, 1984, and then again in 2005 and 2011. Well, that is as far as the English translations are concerned. It, uh, just for you to know that India has given the imprimatur for the Catholic Bible to two only, and that is the NLT in India. I mean, the Indian bishops, Conference of the Catholic Bishops of India have given the imprimatur for the NLT in 2015 and to the ESV Catholic edition in 2017. Now, we come to interpretation interpretation of the text. Interpretation involves two things, exegesis and hermeneutics. Exegesis is to understand a text from a diachronic as well as a synchronic point of view. While, what is diachronic? Through time. It means Exegesis is concerned with the original author's point of view. If Luke, St. Luke has written his gospel, I want to understand his gospel from his point of view. That would be a diachronic presentation of his work. However, scholars say Luke is dead. We cannot ask St. Luke to tell us what exactly he means here. Sometimes certain works have gone through redaction. And because of that, either because of a different level of copying or subsequently, and so scholars today advocate text-centered or reader-centered approaches to scripture, which come under the domain of synchronic approaches, as how meaning changes with time, soon, chronos with time. 
and ultimately diachronic or synchronic. The important thing, dear friends, is this, that I look at the text. I, a reader, look at a text of scripture. I converse, I open the pages, I converse with the text of the Bible. The reader converses with the text, always informed by the world of the author. So that all three domains come into perspective. The world of the author, the world of the text, and the world of the reader. The reader looks at the text and there is back and forth a hermeneutic. The reader looks at the text, the text asks questions of the reader, but while this happens, we are constantly informed by the world of the author. So three worlds are taken into account. So hermeneutics, on the other hand, is an endeavor to grapple the text from the aspect of its meaning for today. The word of God is not dead. It is not just in black and white. It speaks to us today. And in that engagement with the text, that the Holy Spirit is active. As I said at the beginning, much of the word of God can be read by anyone and the Holy Spirit will give enlightenment as you read the text and you dwell with it, ponder on it in prayer. It will come home to you. Bulk of the text will come home to you. It will hit you. But then, of course, you also need to be a bit careful because there are differences in senses. There is, for example, the literal sense. The literal sense of scripture is the sense intended by the author. And this is the most important sense of scripture. But then there is also a spiritual sense. And what is the spiritual sense? That while the literal sense is important, its spiritual sense is also important. That is, the author intends a meaning in the light of the New Testament Christian Christ Paschal Mystery. So in the light of Christ Paschal Mystery, we look even at the Old Testament from a new perspective. It is possible that when the Old Testament writer wrote, for example, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 13, that your house will endure forever, where God is speaking to David of his son, your throne will be established forever. Now, we know that the throne of David ended with the, uh, with, with, with the exile of Babylon, 587. There was no monarchy after that. So in what way is the throne of David endures forever? Is the prophecy of Samuel false? No. We look at the text from a spiritual sense, spiritual interpretation, what does that mean? We are speaking of that in the light of the mystery of Christ, the literal text had has a spiritual sense as well. Without the literal sense, one cannot speak about the fulfillment of scripture. Spiritual sense is not, by the way, a subjective interpretation. Because if it is a subjective interpretation given into everyone's fantasies, then we might get into a lot of trouble. And that is where fundamentalist interpretations are born. And when something is not clear, it's much better to take a commentary, a good commentary, look at it, see what interpretations some learned scholars are giving, or discuss it with someone who knows the scripture, rather than be so hardened and say, now this is what the Lord tells me. Yes, it's possible. The Lord speaks to you that way. But then the next thing is, is it the Lord speaking or is it my own illusion? I think I need to get those things clarified. The next sense is the fuller sense, sensus plenior. This is the deeper meaning of the text intended by God, but expressed, but not clearly expressed by the human author, not clearly expressed by 
the human author. For example, Matthew 1.23 gives the fuller sense to the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. You know Isaiah 7.14? A woman shall conceive and bear a son. You shall name him Emmanuel, for he will be God with us. A woman shall conceive. That is the way it is in Hebrew. Alma. Alma, a young woman, Alma, she will conceive. But the Septuagint translates that word Alma into Parthenos, which means virgin. A virgin will conceive. He will be called Emmanuel. So can you see the movement from the word Alma to Parthenos on the basis of the fuller sense of scripture. Or again, the four servant songs that you have in Isaiah. The four servant songs in Isaiah were in the original in chapters 42, 49, chapter 50, and 52, 53 of Isaiah, second Isaiah, where the servant is more likely the people Israel, but in view of a fuller sense, it is applied to Christ. Christ is that servant. And quite rightly, the church uses the four servant songs during the Holy Week. Holy Week Monday, the four, first servant song. Holy Week Tuesday, the second servant song. Holy Week Wednesday, the third servant song. And the longest servant song from 52, chapter 52, verse 12, 52, verse 13, to 53, verse 12, on Good Friday. Probably you know what I mean by the, the pluck out my beard, they get, they, uh, by his stripes we are healed. It's, it's the torment that the servant undergoes, unjust treatment, and which the New Testament clearly applies to Christ. That would be a fuller sense of that servant uh, as understood in the Old Testament. Besides that, we have the allegorical sense, extended, which is an extended metaphor. You have that, for example, in the parable of the vine and the branches, John 15, or the king who sent his workers to collect his produce. First he sent his servants, they are brutally treated. Then he sends his son, he is killed, clearly referring to Jesus. And the earlier servants referring to the prophets of the Old Testament. This is an allegorical sense. And finally, the accommodative sense in which the New Testament author applies the Old Testament text to a different set of realities than in which it is found. For example, Psalm 19.4. Their voice has gone forth to the ends of the earth. It speaks about how creation is praising God. But Paul has used it in Romans 10.18 in an accommodated sense. In an accommodated sense. He's telling the Gentiles uh, the Jews, that they cannot say that they have not heard the word of God. Their voice has gone forth to the ends of the earth. In the original setting, it was creation praising God in the book of Psalms. But you see how Paul has used it in Romans 10, 18. He's referring to the Jews and the Gentiles who say, uh, who cannot pretend that they have not heard the word of God. Word of God has been evident to them. If they have not heard it, it is their own fault, not the fault of any other. I think it's here I stop. I call uh, Father John Baptist to say the concluding part of the prayer, uh, uh, give the concluding message to you. I thank you very much for your uh, attention. I hope you were able to understand uh, most of what I was saying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. It was a really wonderful lecture. You could cover, starting from the Avestric tradition up to the interpretation, passing through the Old Testament, New Testament, and the text of the Bible, translations of the Bible, inspiration, inerrancy, and uh, about interpretation you have clearly brought out, and especially what is the difference between the Catholic and the Protestant and the other uh, <clears throat> Uh, even religious uh, understanding about the scripture. So now, 
Uh, Father, will you be able to take at least one or two questions if you are interested and if anybody yes, is very yes. eager? Sure, sure. Of course, yeah. yeah. So anybody who has interest, please, there is a uh, option. You go to the chat and now the down there is a raise hand. So you love that. You press it, uh, Vimal will help us. And uh, <clears throat> make a short, brief questions to Father regarding the subject matter that Father spoke, nothing else. Practicality and other things, I will come back again. Only about the subject matter. Go to the chat and you see already my hand is up like that. Anybody want to share your ask questions? I will give you one or two minutes. Father will respond. Yeah, Prashantinu. Yeah. Yes, yes. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Father. My question is, am I audible to you? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, Father Ji, um, see, while discussing with our Protestant brothers, yes. one of the things they said that they don't accept those seven books of the Old Testament mm -hmm. is also because uh, there is, uh, it is not directly connected with uh, the genealogy and uh, of Jesus. Is there any relevance of that or they simply said it? You know, direct evidence or direct uh, information about the resurrection is available only in, in these uh, seven books. It is available in second book of Maccabees. Yeah. It is available in the book of wisdom, book of wisdom chapter three. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died. Remember the text which we use uh, on for funerals. Yeah. Wisdom chapter three. That's true. And, and in the book of, uh, second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, verse 44, 45, somewhere there, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, Judas Maccabees took up a collection to be sent to Jerusalem for the souls of the dead. So this whole idea about the resurrection is there clearly only in these seven, uh, two of the seven books. Yeah. Not, of course, in an indirect way where Jesus says, uh, God is called the God of Abraham, God of uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac, and God of Jacob, God of the living, not God of the dead. That's an indirect way where Jesus showed that the idea of the resurrection is also present in the book of the Torah against the Sadducees, because when the Sadducees ask him the question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? But direct mention of immortality or resurrection, immortality in the book of wisdom and resurrection in the book of second book of Maccabees is there in the seven books. Okay. Yeah. So, no, the point is that the Septuagint is composed by in the diaspora. And it is in the diaspora. You see, the thing is, we are giving only importance to the Babylonian diaspora, where I told you the center of intelligence here was there. But there was another intelligence here which opposed uh, Prophet Jeremiah and went into Egypt and forced him to come there. There is another center of intelligence here where the, if today we want any uh, understanding of what that first draft of the Hebrew text that was taken by Ezra to Jerusalem uh, is, we don't have that copy of the, of the Hebrew Bible anymore. But if we want how that Hebrew copy looked, we have to back translate from the Septuagint into Hebrew. That's the way. So that's where the Septuagint is important. So it's the Septuagint that you have these uh, extra books. Fine. Okay. So okay, now, Father, Father uh, Vimal has some questions through the chat. Vimal, are you there? Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. You can read one or can two questions me? to Father. So, Father can answer. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, like, uh, like the questions are, is the ESV Bible that we can buy? Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's uh, manufactured in Bangalore, no? It's uh, by ATC, Asian Printing Corporation. They were given the right to produce the ESV Catholic edition. Okay, Father. The next one is, what is meant by imprimatur? Imprimatur is given today earlier, an independent bishop could give an imprimatur. That means he sees... Uh, this means let it be printed before 
Maduro is imprimi potest. That means there is no error, no uh, no formal error. So uh, imprimi potest and imprimi Maduro together, let it be printed, was given by the Conference of Catholic Bishops of India. Earlier, a single bishop could give. Today, a single bishop cannot give for a Bible. It has to be given by a conference of bishops. So the Latin bishops of India, which is which is held, uh, by, the title is held, uh, is under CCBI. Cardinal bishops gave the imprimatur on behalf of the CCBI. I, I didn't understand exactly. Exactly, I'm just reading. In which category can yeah. we treat community Bible to be? Uh, that would that will be under the second category, dynamic equivalent. Okay. Um, why do we uh, don't have just one Bible for missile and other Bibles? We have one Bible for the missile now. Okay. It's being used for the for the missile. Now. Um, from Palm Sunday, from Palm Sunday this year, if you read the uh, opening pages of the any of the three volumes of the missile, you will say that this translation replaces all the. Uh, Mr. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, the, the, this translation replaces all the dictionaries of the past. Um, what about the end? Preliminary, the president. Okay, Father. Uh, yeah. The next one is what about the NRSV version of the Catholic Bible? Is it accepted? No, NRSV is not accepted from a liturgical point of view because of the inclusive language, because there are. Uh, because some places, see the Greek word anthropos, which is translated as man, is often understood as genus man, genus man, which means the the from the from, from the uh, not the genus man. Whereas uh, they translate it as brothers and sisters, it's okay when you're doing it, when you're preaching a homily based on that text. But in the ESV, as far as possible, where, where anthropos is used, where if it can be understood as brothers and sisters or, or men and women, then that will be indicated in the footnote. If it is, cannot be said, for example, people gathering together for the election of the apostle of, of, of Matthias in place of Judas. There, you cannot uh, include their men and women. You see, it was, he was to be chosen from men only. So NRSV is a free opening to, it looks uh, a Bible uh, that is quite open to, to the feminists. But it is not acceptable by the church uh, for the Baptist. Okay, we will conclude. Yeah. Because yeah. you can use it for scripture studies. Okay. So now it's getting Mother, time also. Okay, then. Well, one, if you have more questions, you have one more question or only one question? Four more questions. Many? Four or five more questions. Okay, it may take time. We are complete by six o'clock. You can forward all those questions. Uh, I will explain to the participants about our uh, website and uh, Facebook, and there uh -huh. they can get the details. Okay. Maybe so, one more question, which uh, yeah. like, yeah, uh, Father, you spoke of Egyptians and the Canaanites and connected yeah. to the word Yahweh to them. Yeah. Uh, this is new to me, and so is Yahweh word pagan? Is it not uh, no, no, from no, the no, Jews? No, no. So on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land, 40 years on the wilderness, it is there that they had the first encounter with the God they believed in. It is without the God they believed in, they would not have begun their journey. So if, uh, Moses is uh, very particular to tell them that the God who leads them by a pillar of cloud during the day and a fire, pillar of fire by night. So they have an understanding of who God is. Now the name Yahweh to that God is a point of contention 
it is probable that as they pass through the 40 years, a particular place where they could have um, uh, come into contact with the deity very close to the idea of Yahweh, which they then baptized God in Eden. So the idea of God is there, but the clear need for the God they believe they don't have. But that God definitely is understood in uh, the exile. Okay. Okay. Uh, Vimal, you can ask, uh, send them a message asking them to come on the video or a screenshot. So, okay. dear brothers and sisters, uh, really this evening was a wonderful evening and we could uh, learn a lot uh, from Father and uh, especially from the Catholic point of view. There are a lot of other things we can discuss. I asked him to especially what concerns us as Catholics and uh, really he has done justice uh, to the work he has taken. Thank you very, very much, Father, for your contribution, for your full support to the Commission and also in today's class. We thank you sincerely. Now, dear brothers and sisters, um, one or two informations and some clarifications people were asking and maybe of some interest to you. I'll be very brief. So no questions here, only just to listen. So I want to introduce uh, two websites that we have from the Bible Commission. Uh, one is uh, ccbibible.in. That is the official uh, website of the Commission. There you have a lot of materials uh, regarding the Bible. Bible Sunday, uh, daily reading, Sunday re reflections, and Lexio Divina, and even what Father already has written 14 pages, a blog on what is a Catholic and non-Catholic uh, translations, and also now this present talk also we will put everywhere. So kindly visit when you have some time, ccbibible.in, so that will be a very good useful thing. Second one, uh, newly we launched uh, Bible College, Online Bible College, St. Paul Online Bible College. So we have a website and those who want to pursue a two years course, Old Testament and New Testament, we have all the details there. Uh, that cost uh, some 2000 rupees for the online, for postal 500 rupees. And anybody interested, you can visit that website. That website uh, is uh, stpaulbiblecollege.com, all small letters, St. 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 Paul Bible College.com. So, there for those students who are uh, wanting to do a longer course, and some of you already here are our students. So, we open both for students and others. And so, if you are interested, you can visit. And uh, these are the two courses we are offering one is online course, and there is also a postal course. The online course is already launched and many are participating and you can uh, visit that uh, website uh, for the details. Also postal, you can download the application and now for the time being we have stopped to sending the lessons, we are not yet started, but once the situation is normal, we will resume postal uh, Bible correspondence course both in English. So kindly for your information. So many are asking about next class, we plan every month one class each. So as if everything goes on well, we have to do a lot of other things. So every month towards the end of the month, probably last Sunday, we may have it. But it, once everything is ready, we will send it to our students through email and for others via social media. So be aware of it and uh, everything goes on well. We, could, we hope to do it at least for two years, covering all the Old Testament and the New Testament. So that's the thing. And finally, some were asking about the uh, fees for this. So this video, this video course or uh, webinar costs nothing. It is completely free. And uh, only thing you have to uh, get the link uh, online and you can come in. And if at all, if you want to donate or uh, do some donation, go to our website, official website. There is a so otherwise, uh, the webinar is completely free for you. If you have still any doubts, clarification doubts, and uh, we have our web, our emails in our website, so you can write to us. Please avoid calling because unnecessary times, unnecessary, we cannot concentrate 
send email as much as possible we will respond is it okay so kindly everybody come on the video so that uh, vimal will take a, a screenshot for our record otherwise everything is okay so if you have any doubt please write to us we'll be in touch i really appreciate your interest uh, for taking up this uh, class today so thank you very very much we will take uh, some time to take all the shots we have to take part by part till vimal says uh, we be on the line then you can give so we thank everybody who collaborated for this first almighty god who has given this great occasion for us and also to our bishop who gave his blessings to start this course and of course our professor uh, father cc saldana uh, very beautifully explained to us uh, the very basic catholic uh, things that we should know as catholics so and also vimal uh, from the diocese of sultan pet is a priest he is taking care of the communication and other technicalities and also there is one for the sudarshan from the dais of vello he is recording everything and we are thinking of putting it in our website and future also we will start a youtube channel so as much as possible we will come on the online and also we will be starting a facebook in our saint paul bible college you can come on that also so a lot of things are there for you to enrich your knowledge and you come closer to the word of god and benefit from that so thank you one and all